Katharina, lovely to hear from Perth, Western Australia, where a high 30 degrees. T- I didn't think I'd be so jealous so quickly today, but uh, that sounds wonderful there, Catherine. Yeah, we, Welcome we, there today. We don't, we don't need to hear this. <laughs> <laughs> we, we don't need any of that. Uh, I must warn you, there's lots of people from Wales here and where it's uh, the weather is not 30 degrees and uh, usually sunny. <laughs> Oh, my, uh, Colleen, lovely. Minus one in Calgary and 5 AR. Thank you, Colleen, for joining us. I very much appreciate it. Lovely to see you here. Um, Ronan's coming from sunny Donegal, which uh, Emma's from sunny in Cardiff. Bit chilly, yeah. But, um, can we beat a minus five in Calgary? For uh, so One end is a minus five in Calgary and the other is the 30 degrees in Perth, Australia. Matt, it's sunny in Rofe, but you always say that about Rofe, Matt, don't you? It's always sunny. <laughs> so do put in the chat where you're calling from, what's the weather doing, and um, I say give it a few minutes and we get away. Bright and breeze, I presume that's the weather you're talking about there, Russell. It's, it's applicable across the piece. Uh, hi, Wickham from Car- Caroline, but sunny, but the wind is lovely and warm. I've just been in my garden. Uh, mm. It's just amazing. I noticed it last night. The wind is really warm suddenly. It's just extraordinary. I'm trying to remember my geography O level now. So that must mean that's a, a southerly... Uh, um, uh, continental wind, possibly. <laughs> Suffolk and... Well, it comes with me, do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> and breezy in Suffolk from Alan. Good to see, good to see you here today, Alan. Same, Andy. So, so just give a... Um, uh, yeah, let's just do it another couple of minutes. Welcome, everyone. Yeah. It's going to allow for the hecticness of our lives. <laughs> Sunny in Wrexham, where we were uh, the the Grow Social Capital team were in Wrexham last night virtually. Um, do you want to share with people what what we did in Wrexham, Russell? Uh, so yeah, yesterday lunchtime we had uh, well one of these sort of um, chats, one of these seminars with Mark Jones, who was one of the founding trustees and kind of activists behind the site Seren, which is uh, Welsh for Seven Stars. Um, sort of community pub and hub for Welsh language community in Wrexham. Um, I hadn't quite realised it was quite so long ago, actually, that they they first got started. So it's celebrating their 10th anniversary next year, which uh, is no mean feat, obviously, for a pub, though this this last year has been has been difficult in terms of trading conditions. But, um, yeah, you just talked about, you know, how, um, you know, how they brought the community along with them in that in that endeavour um, and what they feel they they contribute to to the to the community in Wrexham, both both within the Welsh speaking community and and um, and outside of it. And I think what Mark helpfully did was demonstrate, and I think this is quite applicable to the concept of social capital. What he did was demonstrate that you know one isn't a Welsh speaker or not, or member of a community or not. That it's a bit more of a spectrum. And um, yeah, he uh, he talked a bit about that, and we'll have that online to play back if people wish um, before too long. And a great place to go if you're ever in Wrexham. I, I, I'd recommend it. Right. Shall we give it a start? And then we'll just welcome people as they come. Okay, fine. Then. I'm okay, happy so... to admit and, and as, they, as I see them. Uh, yeah, okay, All right. Okay, so welcome everyone here to uh, a special event as part of Social Capital Week, where we're exploring the what's called Social Capital Comms, uh, and we're looking at new ways, different ways where we can engage, uh, communicate, and create the change we want to see in the world today. And um, with us today, uh, as I say, so this is the, um, hosted by Grow Social Capital. We're a new social enterprise. Uh, the team there, uh, myself at the top left, uh, with uh, Russell Todd. Uh, and we've also got here today Matt Appleby um, and then our other colleague Sarah Tamsin. Uh, and as I say, we've, 
a new social enterprise really addressing the challenge that um, uh, we're witnessing a world of uh, mm -hmm. growing division, distrust, where you've got one group of uh, people increasingly not talking to the other. And we believe that the changing levels in social capital, where people are increasingly connecting with people like themselves and less so with people unlike themselves, is really uh, underpinning many of the challenges our society faces. And we believe that by being smarter, being more aware of uh, social capital, how it works, how it can be invested and grown, can be a way forward in creating a better, more caring, more tolerant society. Uh, we have here today uh, two very special guests. Um, and what am I suggest actually, guys, if uh, you'd like to sort of maybe introduce yourself? Um, uh, top left there, we've got Matt Appleby. So, Matt, do you want to say a few words about yourself? Want to unmute and uh, say a few words? Yeah, sure. Um, welcome, everybody, and uh, and thanks for joining us. Uh, my name's Matt. I've got a background in uh, PR and um, responsible business. Um, I've known Andy uh, many years and uh, was uh, thrilled to kind of draw a few of those strands together around purposeful communications and uh, the role of business into Grow Social Capital when we launched um, a couple of months ago. Uh, Caroline? I to go last, Andy. Is that all right? <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, Ronan. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Um, I actually I knew Andy 15 years ago. He, he he got me a job when I moved up to Wakefield, um, and we hadn't spoken in all of that time. Um, so it's really interesting to be here and I'm really interested about what, to see what comes out of today. My background is um, uh, PR. I started in, uh, in PR in London in the dot-com era and then moved over to more um, uh, activist -y stuff when there was a burning rage in me um, and I became part of Occupy London back 10 years ago. Um, and then... Um, I, I was part of the press team there and then most recently I've been part of Extinction Rebellion. I was their media messaging coordinator, um, seeing it grow much like a startup from a small little entity into uh, something global. Thank you, Ronan. Uh, so just to introduce myself, I'm Andy Green, uh, Director of Grow Social Capital, uh, also a background in public relations and communications. Uh, both Matt and I are founder supporters of an initiative called the Dublin Conversations, uh, which is um, developing new thinking, new ways of doing for how we can uh, address the challenges of a more divided world. So what Grow Social is doing is really putting into practice many of the ideas and thinking uh, created through the Dublin Conversations. Conversations, and we'd be delighted to share with anyone the new thinking and tools uh, over the coming weeks uh, and really delighted to be here today. So, uh, Caroline, over to you. Yes, thank you, Andy. Uh, so, yes, I'm Caroline Pekel. I'm, I come from the world of business. I run my own consultancy uh, focusing on qualitative research, innovation, communications in general, uh, but in, in particular dialogue. I became a specialist in dialogic processes and I had a big transition. I worked for the biggest names. Uh, Disney companies were my biggest clients for about 12 years. Um, and I had a big transition about eight, nine years ago, uh, which led me to join Extinction Rebellion two years ago and bringing all the tools and, and I guess the training I had collected over the years when it comes to communication and, and in, in particular dialogue. So, uh, so today is giving you a taste, a taster of, of all the things that have made Extinction Rebellion successful in terms of the, the way we communicate and the way we share together. Well, how, how, you know, people always ask, how is it that you look so disorganized and still, things still happen in such an orderly fashion? So uh, there's a reason for that. You know, it's just the way, the, the way we run our meetings and the way we run ourselves in many ways. Am I okay to, to carry on, Andy? Uh, you're muted. Oh, okay, <laughs> okay, just make sure. Uh, so I'm just gonna invite you to mute yourselves unless, uh, except for Andy. <laughs> Uh, and then just unmute yourself when you need to speak and, and ask um, ask for your turn to speak so it's easier because it's it's still quite 21 of us so it's, and I can't see all of you so I'm just so uh, I'm going to try to hold space for all of us and the first thing I'm going to invite you to do is the way we check in um, at any meeting we run uh, within Extinction Rebellion we check in and we check in with two questions the first question is how am I feeling 
And the second, second question is, what do I need to be present to this meeting? So think about that. First of all, we connect at heart level. We don't stay in our head. So we bring the whole of who we are as much as we can. So how am I feeling? Just reconnecting with how I'm feeling. And I'm going to invite you to type it in the chat box. So I'm feeling and I need to be present, whatever. Is that all right? So I'm going to give, give you a few minutes to do that. Just take time to reflect. How am I feeling? What do I need to be present? And just put it in the chat box for everyone to read. Okay, I'm going to just let others finish if they haven't. I'm just going to carry on. Uh, so the idea is to give you a taster of, of the kind of things we do at, in, in life, literally. And then we'll be staying on for another half an hour at the end. So if you, if you have questions, you can then uh, ask questions at this stage. So let's just be open to the experience. So one of the big things that I've learned uh, within Extinction Rebellion is to actually learn to uh, communicate and share with people I would have never communicated with or shared with before. So we all work in silos, live in silos, in you know, quite, quite strict, tight compartments, really, when you don't realize it. But once you get to do uh, what we do in the street, you know, literally doing an action in the street, you meet anyone from anywhere, literally. Uh, and that's a challenge. It's a challenge in communication, in how we share and how we work together. So uh, the, one of the key things is to remain open. So if you don't mind, um, uh, next slide, please, Andy. Okay, move on. Uh, so the one of the models that uh, I personally use and recommend is to keep your mind open, keep your heart open and you will open. Next slide. The reason for that is that we have a tendency, um, just the Sorry, one before, please. please. <laughs> well, this is my fault, yeah. Okay, so, <laughs> all right. Just the guy. It's the one before, please. Okay, thank you. The reason for that is uh, we have a tendency when we meet each other, we have a tendency to uh, judge, judge one another. And you, you saw me, you, I started speaking, you made some judgments immediately because we're social animals. This is what we do. We assess each other and say, oh, is she okay? What's she going to be like? You know, is it going to be interesting? Is it worth me staying? You know, that kind of thing. This is the way, this is what happens to all of us, you know, when we, we meet people for the first time. Uh, the second one, when it comes to feelings, you know, the first question when we check in is, how am I feeling? It's the voice of cynicism. So cynicism is not honoring one's feelings. This is what it's all about, you know, and it's particularly prominent, you know, um, a certain age, certain gender. And I'm, I won't quote them, but is this, it is clear that, you know, some of us have have more, more troubles acknowledging how we feel. And this is something that takes practice. So the practice is just re simply remaining open to how we're feeling, you know, remaining open and willing to find out, you know, how we're feeling. And the third one, open will, is quite important because it's about fear. So it's allowing for the fact when we talk, we talk about climate change, the, the ideas that we all fear for, really. It's just, it's just acknowledging, admitting to our fear. You know, so, so we're all equal in that process, but it's an intention. So I'm asking you to agree to the intention of remaining open, if that's OK. Yeah, just that's an invitation, of course, always. Whatever I'm asking you to do will always be an invitation. It's up to you to decide whether you want to go and, and do it. But it's an invitation for now. Uh, next slide, please. 
So um, when I saw uh, coming, I did, I studied dialogue uh, around the world, literally for change management. I did a lot of change management within uh, corporations uh, and uh, dialogue, di dialogic processes are the most important uh, processes that are being used. So when I saw XR doing a, pe a people's assembly, as they call them, in the street, I thought, oh my God, they're doing dialogue in the street. How can that be? And they, we do people's assemblies in all sorts of different ways. The one on the right at the bottom was at the modern take, take modern, you know, so where, where we were invited to run a big, uh, a big session, a big people's assembly with a general public. I run a people's assembly with Greenwich. That's the one on, on at the bottom on the left, you know, uh, you know, responding to council's declaration of emergency. So there's lots of different reasons why we do assemblies, but it's a specific process that's based on three key pillars, which I'd like to talk about um, and which we would like to experience together in some ways. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, that's the way we are. We're all different. We look different, different shapes, different colors. Next slide. And we all bring different talents. I always, anyone who wants to join Extinction Rebellion say, you put gifts. What are your gifts? What are the gifts that you bring to the table? And that's the situation with all of us in any gathering, in any, in, in any circle that we may join. Next slide. Um, and my experience of communication, which is reflected in the assembly process, is that we move from cliches, oh, how are you? How are you? I'm fine. You know, we, we know what that means. And then we get to the facts and say, oh, what time did I get up? How much did I sleep? And then we express opinions. That's usually where we stay in the average conversations. OK, it's when we get to feelings. It's just level four where things become interesting because we'd start connecting. We'd start kind of understanding, oh, you as well. Oh yes, I, I heard that noise. Yes, I woke up too. And oh yes, I felt quite frightened. You know, this is something that we start sharing in a way that doesn't happen if we stay with the first three levels. And the most important uh, aspect uh, of the assembly process is complete openness. It requires, as you see, one of the pillars is trust. And we do have to trust one another to be respectful and kind to one another, to be able to feel that we can be completely open. Okay. But that's the invitation. So it's again, openness is very important in this process. Next slide. Oh, uh, yes. Yeah, so, um, yeah, that's fine. Uh, yes, that's fine. You can move on. Thank you. Uh, and, and the next one. <laughs> and the next one. So what we aim to uh, in the assembly process is to the bottom to get to the bottom line. Usually we arrive, you know, when we do uh, people's assembly in the street, people join, they don't know each other. It's always, we suddenly are with strangers. We, you know, we moved into a, a field where we are alone, sometimes with a friend, sometimes someone we know, but actually sharing and, and trying to understand and working with people we don't know. So the idea of the, the assembly process is take you to, to right to the bottom state. Next slide, please. And again, so um, assemblies come, have been used in social movements. So uh, Ronan will talk about uh, assemblies, you know, being used, for instance, during uh, the Occupy movement. You know, they've, they've been they've been they've been the essence, you know, of how people have communicated. So whether it's in Spain, whether it's the with the uh, Arab revolt in, in North Africa, you know, it's been really used everywhere. It comes from a very indigenous way of being together, you know, and one of the key story that we always refer to is the children's fire. So it's the idea that we all chiefs, we all have our seat around the fire and we all have a responsibility towards the children's fire. So ensuring that whatever decision, whatever action we take, whatever decision we make is towards preserving and protecting the children's fire so that the children, the next generations have a fire. You know, obviously without fire, we can't live, we can't survive. Um, next uh, slide, please. So uh, the one before, please. So the most important thing we're going to invite you to go into uh, those three pillars uh, that uh, kind of, of the assembly process. The first one is deep listening. So we're going to have a practice. The second one is uh, trust. And the third one is inclusivity. So we're going to do uh, a couple of things around uh, listening and uh, trust the way we would we would do and the way we practiced in, in many other ways uh, that we gather within XR. The, the principle of listening is uh, really to listen from the heart. You know, so we of council, when we gather together, you know, we bring our authentic stories, we speak from the heart, we trust that we'll be heard and we'll be honoured. You know, we won't be questioned, we won't be challenged, we'll simply have space held for us to share our story as it is, without interruptions, interjections. And everyone else will be listening to it from the heart. So with care, I always say hug the other with your full attention. 
Okay, that's going to be the principle. And B of lean expression, you're going to have a specific time, you know, I think we, uh, we said three minutes each, so you're going to have three minutes each to share your story and just be open and spontaneous about it. And if you run out of things to say, the other person listening to you may say anything else. I just hold space and let the silent silence come in between each other. Don't be embarrassed or let's just have the experience of having silence with someone you don't necessarily know that you're sharing, you know, an authentic story with. And just see what happens. It's just an experience. Let's just see what, what it's like for you. Next slide. Uh, next slide. Uh, so uh, the hand signals are quite important. I'll mention them now. Um, you don't need to use them in your listening practice, but we will use them immediately afterwards. So the two that I suggest is that we always wave when we agree. We don't have to say, oh, yes, me too, all the interruptions. We just wave. I wave all the time now. And people say, oh, are you OK? I said, yes, I'm agreeing. <laughs> it's like the XR signal, you know, in outside Extinction Rebellion. Say, oh, she must be connected to XR. Because <laughs> we just do it systematically. And we always ask for a turn. And this, the, any meeting is always facilitated. Someone's just take charge. Okay, I'll facilitate. And the facilitation is always about equality, making sure there is space for everyone to be heard and to share what they feel to, to, they need to share and to allow for people to witness other people's sharing. So witnessing, you don't have to share systematically. And, and we always say witnessing what other people share is as important as sharing itself. But it's kind of acknowledging that role too. So just take, taking turns, and then agreeing is probably enough. But you see, we have lots of others, you know, whenever we, we move into kind of a more sophisticated meetings, I would say. OK, uh, next slide, please. So uh, three pillars, uh, I was saying active listening, trust and uh, radical inclusivity. We're going to move. Russell is going to be uh, pairing you. We're going to move into a breakout, breakout room uh, with someone else. And the deal is, as, I mean, it's up to you. It's the offer. It's the it's offer on the table here. Three minutes each. The theme is, uh, next slide please, the theme is going to be about togetherness because that belongs to the theme of, of the whole of this week about when we talk about social capital, you know, social good as I call it. Um, uh, we're going to ask you to share a story of a moment or a time when you experience a sense of togetherness, something recent, something in the last day, the last week, the last month. What does it mean to be together for you? What does it mean to feel together? What is togetherness? What's the story of togetherness that you can share with that other person? Okay, so take some, when you meet, say hello. Take some time to reflect on what your story is going to be and take turns. Three minutes each, time each other, so you'd be kind and, and equal in that way. As I said, when you speak, you speak from the heart. When you listen, you listen from the heart. No comments, no interjections, no questions. Just really deep listening, just holding space for one another to share one story on togetherness. Is that okay? Okay. Let's, let's, let's go for it. I should be receiving an invitation to join the breakout room. Interesting. Um, sorting out now as we speak. Okay. Hello. Hi, Emma. So, I'm okay. Let me just pause the record. Is it like when you listened in this way, you know, and it, it's it's good and bad. There's everything in, involved in there. So what, if we could uh, have a few sharing of of your experiences, you know, whatever happened there. Anyone, anyone would like to start? Let's talk about what it's like to be able to to share in this way, where you just completely listened. Any feedback? Yes, Alan. Um, though we didn't have enough time to discuss, what I found is someone I've never met before, who's you know, however many miles away, many, many miles away, we had a lot in common. Mm -hmm. We done had a lot of common experience, actually. And, and though I talked about something different and didn't have the chance to follow on by some of the things that that I did in an environment here in Suffolk in England, it was actually very similar to what the person was talking about in Wales around community building and things. And I found that really fascinating, but if only we had one had a bit more time, <laughs> we could have explored those things. Okay, so the most important thing is discussion. It's if you avoid discussion, if you just allow for open, complete sharing, 
don't move into discussions because discussions you're going to get questions and questions can be very challenging to one another so just allowing for that emergence of of commonality of what we share you know to to emerge spontaneously any other feedback on yes go ahead roger um with uh, my discussion uh, caroline i think we very quickly established that we had um a lot of um similarly common areas of interest based on you know significant disruption in our lives within the last um a few months or so let alone the pandemic so that was quite reassuring and uplifting um, um of, of, of sharing that experience and um um to highlight a fact that uh, you know we're, we're, we're not alone in all of this so um that was that was very helpful and uh, reassuring i have to say mm -hmm. one more person to be able to share in this way got okay. kim with a hand up so oh, sorry oh yes kim kim go ahead Hi everyone. I, I thought it was quite lovely and for me I'm usually a talker and I'm I admit I'm often just thinking of what I'm going to say next but I really got drawn into Ronan's story and when it came my turn I didn't know what to say because it was just lovely to just sit and and listen uh, to that story so it was just a, a lovely experience. Mm. Was it difficult in any way? Did anyone find it kind of challenging? Any challenges that you've experienced in, in having to share in this way or listen in this way? Yes, go on, Emma. I think it's always a little bit awkward at first with somebody you haven't already met because um, you, you don't know what the common threads between you are. So it's not necessarily immediately obvious what topic of conversation to choose. But you had togetherness as a subject, isn't it? So yeah. was there anything else that kind of came in in the way, I would say? Is there anything that you experienced? No, no? I don't think okay. so. Great. Anybody else? What's it like to be listened in this way? Was there any, any feedback on that? The experience of being listened without questions, interjections, comments? If that's, if that's the way it was, I don't know if you managed to do that. Yes, Philip? Yes, I think it's really very refreshing to be able to actually communicate, you know, all the things you want to say and then come to a stop yourself without that concept of, uh, of, of interruptions and then having to reformulate what you were about to say next and so on and so forth. So, you know, it, it's, it, it, it's not something that one does in normal conversation because there's always to and forth. Uh, and so that was really quite a refreshing uh, experience to be able to come to a natural stop and then wait. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anybody else on this one they listen to in this way? One more person? Go on, guys. One more person. Have you experienced something? Yes, go on, Colleen. Thank you. I was just going to say it, it was refreshing because um, I do sometimes tend to hold back and I know I was asked to go first and it had to really, yeah, it just kind of started to open up and having the person's attention and they were really listening. It was, it was refreshing and just nice to share. Thank you. So the principle of, of listening and sharing in this way, which we apply in all our meetings at Extinction Rebellion, because they facilitate in this way, means we all take turns, we ask for our turn, we share, and then we have the wrapping up signal from the facilitator when we go on a little. Okay, that's a really important signal when we do meetings. But the, the reality is that we then can make and share and make decisions very quickly because we really are listening to each other and we see what's emerging among ourselves in terms of what are, ah, that's the direction that we seem to all be going, or we have a split between this and that, that's the choice we have to make. Do you see what I'm saying? Because we are, we try to practice and it's very hard. I facilitated the political circle for over a year and uh, it was quite well known that it could got, get quite uh, noisy. So facilitating in this way kind of made it really kind of more flowing and really listening to different perspectives more easily and, and being able to move forward with decisions more effectively. Does that make sense? 
And it's, it takes practice. It's not pleasant because you have to shut up literally when you want to speak. <laughs> And you know, and it's, it takes it takes discipline. There's a certain kind of, and and in that discipline, there's respect. And uh, going back to what Emma was saying, there's trust. And that's a, that's the second pillar in the assembly process that we rely on. It's really trusting the process, trusting the the principles of engagement that I would say that we agree, we abide by, and uh, trusting one another. So I would like to, I uh, would just like to go and move into a more kind of a big circle sharing now. The same principle, taking turns, speaking from the heart. What is trust for you? What happens? What are your stories of trust? We'll just take a moment to reflect now. Just like give, let's you know, give ourselves like a minute. What does trust mean? You know, how do we trust? How do I trust? How do I experience trust? What do I need to trust? So the, the challenge would be just to share stories, situations, circumstances, experiences of trust. So don't leave it at, a, you know, the conceptual level or the opinions or, you know, the different five stages. It's more kind of inc including the five levels of complete openness in terms of my experience of trust. So I'd be as open and we'll, we'll be kind and respectful to one another in this way. Anyone can start. Just uh, ask for, for your turn and hopefully we can all have a go. Yes, go on, Andy. We originally set this um, event up as a, almost like a, a lecture that we were going to tell people a way of doing uh, and give people a uh, process and so on. And the, uh, and the massive thing is we, uh, we had two meetings, uh, Matt and I, with yourself and Rowan beforehand. And um, we just threw that in the bin. And... Um, today i've never looked forward to a meeting so much yet also never been so fearful of you know how's it going to go uh, and so but i've just got implicit trust not just in you the process but also myself in terms of just learn to be comfortable about being uncomfortable and a far bigger dividend will emerge from that so in, in mm. terms of you know tapping into trust there mm. lovely thank you andy anyone else Tim. And then I have Alan and Adrian. Um, it's interesting for me, I tend to be a person who trusts automatically and uh, give it with good intentions. And in But what I need to preserve that trust is that sense of belonging and acceptance. And I would say probably where I've experienced that most recently has been with Andy in conducting uh, the Dublin Conversations Purpose Pilot in Canada is coming together with a group and automatically just feeling trusted and, and that sense of belonging and acceptance, no matter what, you know, the, the outcome was. So I think that that's probably one of my most recent experiences. Thank you, Kim. Alan? Yeah, um, trust is very important in in Gypsy Roma communities. So I'm just gonna speak some instances of that if I may, because it comes more from, from heart. And, and to me, it's around doing what you say, always, not just once, but always, respecting each other and each other's different viewpoint, um, being there when needed, which may be a, a very awkward time or something, but someone needs help and they, they will want that there and then because that's very urgent to them those are three things that spring up if I had more time I'd probably think of more but things that to me in my past experience have been very important elements of trust mm -hmm. wonderful thank you Alan and I had Adrian um I used to be a politician and uh and and I suppose the issue for me with trust is is about um, people being open to ideas um, I trained originally as a journalist and uh, I worked in a newsroom where my boss would encourage me to come up with new ideas, but often in the public sector I would encourage people, people I would encounter people who would say uh, new ideas were presented to them 
we don't have capacity, we can't do, we don't have money. And so they threw um, cold water on a good idea at the very start of the process. And I always think that if there's a good idea there, there's always opportunity to do something and to explore that and to listen to people and say, well, actually, we may not have lots of money, but we could do X, Y, and Z, and we could go along and, and see what we could do. You know, if, you, if people kind of start to put things down, it's it's very destructive. And I often see that with people in, in poor and, and privileged positions with the public, that they, they will talk down perfectly good ideas and say, oh, no, we can't do that. We don't have the money, we don't have the capacity. Um, and it's really, they just don't want to do it. And, uh, you know, I think where there's the will, there's a way. And I think that's the, it's about being open to that conversation and letting people talk and be heard and say, okay, you've got an idea. And actually, as, as that got common support out there, maybe we should look at it and see how we could, we could do something. Um, and that motivates people a little bit. to hear, feel they're being listened to. I think that uh, you'll get a lot of support. Whereas if you simply are shut down and you're just, somebody's just talking at you and saying, this is what I want to do, I'm not interested in you, uh, then I think the trust is pretty broken and it's very hard to get people inside. Thank you, Adrian. Just so you know, you, you were breaking up a little once in a while. So just so that you know for your sound, yes. Anybody else? Anyone else, trust, what's that trust mean for you? Russell? Um, so a bit of a languages lesson. So trust in Welsh is uh, is umviriad, so to, to trust the verb. Um, English, I think English did away with its reflexive verbs. French still has them. Welsh does. So the um means it's a reflexive thing, and it comes from the from the word tyrio, which is to ground, to put something down, to land. And uh, the reflexive mean it's about grounding yourself. And I think there's something quite, uh, I think there's something quite meaningful about that sense that it's this very much this. Um, almost making yourself vulnerable a little bit because you are you're laying down I guess maybe once upon a time arms or some sort of you know tribal colors or or, or something and it's this sense that uh, um, you, you know you are putting yourself at at some form of um, vulnerability I, I I guess I think there's something quite um, quite deep about that so um, mm -hmm. I'm very ed so there we go and that, that's that's your that's your wealth lesson for today thank you any other any other yes Roger Um, just picking up on Russell's point, I think um, as flawed and vulnerable, fearful human beings, I think trust is about um, having a feeling of being safe. Um, uh, that, that's, that's, what, that's what strikes me, is uh, having, having that trust that um, you will be, uh, to a degree, safe and protected from uh, things that you are fearful of or um, concerned about or un 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 unwittingly um, have no knowledge of, um, fear of the unknown, if you will. So I think there's a, there's a safety element to um, instilling um, a sense of trust. Thank you, Roger. Any more? Any from the ladies? We had Kim, bring me in more from ladies. Yes, Emma. I think historically I found it easier to trust people who wear their hearts on their sleeves. So if they appear at the outset to be open and um, open with their feelings in particular, then I've always thought, oh, you know, this person's so open, they're obviously trustworthy. Um, but actually that's not always the case because people don't always practice what they preach. So I think maybe nowadays I try to wait until they, it's not what they say, but it's what they do. I think which is going back to what somebody said at the beginning oh. um actions maybe speak louder than words especially for people who who aren't so open they're more of an introvert it's quite difficult to gauge trust when it takes longer to get to know somebody mm -hmm. so maybe it's length of length of the relationship and actions mm -hmm. one more one more contribution trust yes colleen It's uh, echoing Kim and uh, Emma a little bit. Uh, I'm, I walk into a relationship and I'll trust you immediately, but you've got to continue to earn that trust. And uh, once it's broken, I think it's, it's hard 
uh, to gain it back. And it goes back to, um, yeah, doing what you say and, and um, kind of walking that, that, that talk. And to me, integrity is a, a big piece of, of trust. Mm. And if you've um, broken that, um, yeah, that, that integrity, you cross the line, it's, it's very, very hard to, to come back from that for me. Mm -hmm. Great. So just to make sure we have a bit of time for Ronan to talk about why, how all these things have been really helpful in, in comms in particular, you know, Ronan being the head of the media messaging for a long time within uh, Extinction Rebellion. Um, I just wanted to highlight the fact that we have a facilitator and we also have a note taker, a minute taker in every single meeting. So when we mean to say who's going to be the facilitator, who's going to be the minute taker? And I took notes, but I know we would have then immediate, immediate, immediate notes. And for people who didn't attend the meeting, they could just read the minutes and would get a sense of what they missed. So there was always ongoing communication in this way. And I heard a lot about taking risks when it comes to trust, you know, being the ability to be uncomfortable, to expose oneself and feel vulnerable. You know, and the key phrase is like do, doing what you say. So we start trusting what that person is really embodying their words. And there's lots of different phrases that I've taken note of, you know, that you've mentioned. Um, and the idea of experiment, that there's a sense that, oh, there's something new that we need to risk. We need to take a risk because we it's not the normal norm. You know, the, the chit chat, the normal conversations we go, it's got some structure to it. It's kind of comfortable because we can rely on it, but it doesn't take us to the depth uh, of sharing that we need to be efficient and quick. You know, that's obviously, when we're in the street, we need to make decisions very quickly. So using this process is, is very powerful, really very powerful. So I hope you enjoyed the, 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 the very, it's really like a taster. <laughs> Ronan, over to you. So, so um... There's a bit of me that's been umming and eyeing about, oh, I should tell you the story of Extinction Rebellion and, and you know, all of the things that have, has happened and what, what we did and how, you know, 22 thirds of the, the UK has declared a climate emergency, all of those things. But I'm just going to put them all to the side because because it's that's going to probably take us to a place of, of in the head and whatnot. And, and this is there's, there's actually the untold story, which is is, is, is much to me is much more interesting. It's not the stuff that makes the headlines, but you know, when people are uh, stopping cars or whatever, um, but it, it's, it. so I'll give you an example. So, so with, when we were um, talking to journalists, one of the things we would always do would, would we, and it was a very deliberate decision. We, we, we decided, well, you know, how, how do we, bring the whole of us into these discussions? How do we bring emotion into these discussions? Because if we talk to journalists about the stats, you know, and the stats are terrifying, um, then, then we lose them. We, we're, not, we're not speaking to the whole of them. So, so we would always try and, and, and talk to people um, uh, and ask them how they feel. Um, and that was where, 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 where every conversation began and, and we wouldn't rush in any way to get on to, to a, what, whatever news story we wanted to sell or anything like that, because there's, there's just no point. It's, 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 it's like this, it was always about building a relationship um, one by one with different journalists as, as, as we went. And, you know, that um, I could go into tactics, but I'll leave that for another time, another, another place. It, it's so what happened sometimes in those conversations was seeing what emerged when people would talk about how they feel. And th this is this is people at a range of publications you would not expect, you know, and, th and then then at times, you know, there's a network there of people who know each other and will will talk in, in the pub or you know in their private lives. And then other people would come to us and say, you know what, I'm a rebel too. Um, this is this is like journalists, you know, <laughs> in places you would not expect. Um, so, so it, it for me at that time, 
um, it was really that a lot of the thoughts were going through, you know, you know how journalists fight over stories. So, so looking at um, competition versus collaboration, and it was almost like that it was emerging, and I do believe it is emerging even more so now with, with journalists who don't really care who gets the story. They just see it's important that somebody's is covering it and bringing it to the fore, and particularly in the climate and the ecological stuff that is happening. So, so there, there was that, and there was the, the one example I would pull out is, is with the BBC. We met, met with, with some of the, the top boards at the BBC, and um, uh, it was the most interesting discussion. And it, uh, when the question was asked about how do you feel, um, there was a person of a certain age with a certain kind of colour, certain gender, who said, no, we're not talking about emotions here. And the emotions weren't allowed. And, and you could see that the, the people who were younger all kind of went, oh, OK. It wasn't talked about in that room, and it, it, but it was, it was there. And just because something isn't talked about, it doesn't mean it's not present. So, so, so we, it, it was all the way through that conversation was, was that blockage. Um, and also, you know, we were left that that very same person said, said you know, um, uh, I'm very sorry, you know, we, we, we have a lot of agreement with your, your, your campaign, but it is a campaign. And we, we were, all of us, we were like, well, hello, this is not a campaign. This, this, is, this is about the life and death of, 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 of the future generations to come. This is not a campaign. Um, so we were left, left there flabbergasted. But we know that the coverage in the BBC, and we know that there are many people in the BBC who, who were very, very supportive. And so this, this disruption on many levels was, was very interesting. So you had the, the streets, but you also have the, you know, it's revolutionary to just actually listen and, it, and, and to, or to hear um, in this world. So, so there's two kind of closing points I want to make, which is, is really around um, the messaging of XOR. So, so in those moments, it, it, there was always a kind of, this is, you know, when, when we really felt we were in the news, when, when something like uh, uh, the April 2019 rebellion was happening, um, we'd always come back to, okay, let's take a moment of calm and think about, well, what's, what's our higher, higher, you know, if we were in contact with a higher purpose here, what would we be saying? And then we would, you know, connect with our hearts to really feel that. And then we would think, well, that's a bit worthy. We can't say it like that. So we would throw in a bit of humor and a bit of trickster to, to, to make it very direct language that would actually speak to people on a real level. And it, the last thing I want to say, which, which is, is it really speaks to the togetherness in this, I think the current situation we live in the world, um, there are two choices. You know, we, we, we either continue this culture of separation um, and we go further down that road of separation, choosing more separation and dividedness, or we choose togetherness, and and it's only through the opening of our hearts, on the, on the, this in this through this kind of experience, and whether that's got the XOR brand or whether that's through social capital. I think this is all very good to see. Thank you, Ronan. So uh, we hope it gives you the sense of human connection that we believe XR brings and has been the essence of its success, you know, in terms of how we brought people together to have this sense of togetherness from people moving from everywhere in the country, you know, gathering in London and just running the, the show the way they did, you know, running actions and, and taking risks, sacrificing, making sacrifices, you know, giving the liberty away, being arrested for the first time, you know, it's very moving situations that we and witnessing each other you know, in the situation. So, uh, and, and having those processes, having those ways of, of sharing together, you know, these principles of engagement, as I call them, which were really the essence of, of being together. And I, like Ronan, I've tried it a lot. I've run a working group called XR Catalyzers, whose mandate is to engage in dialogue with people in places of significant power and influence. So we've been connecting people at heart level in all sorts of different ways. We've just taken the risk, basically. And I've always offered, would you like me to run a meeting the XR way? And there's always curiosity. So I've done it with the police, I've done it with civil service, I've done it with politicians, and it always works because we're all humans, you know? And we get to a level of sharing, of honesty, 
of truth that is essential in really kind of being able to take actions that are that are needed. Uh, so handing it back to Andy and Matt. Thanks, Caroline. Um, that it's enormously powerful what you do, and, and Andy and I, as as you know, with that first conversation with you, we were straight on the phone to each other saying that was that was kind of a, a really mind blowing way of running a meeting. Um, so I'm really glad that we've we've managed to share that with people, and and uh, that others have been able to to experience that. And I hope everyone's taken as much from it as we have. Um, we are able to stay on um, after one o'clock, but before everybody goes. Um, just wanted to give a plug to our event tomorrow, our, our final event um, of um, Social Capital Week, uh, which is a conversation with Sophie Howe, the Future Generations Commissioner for Wales, um, the first Future Generation Commissioner in the world um, and um, recognised by many as, as one of um, certainly the UK's leading um, experts in change making and change makers. And we chose Sophie because tomorrow um, we're launching something called Tumla School. Tumla is a, is a Yiddish word um, that is applied to people who are employed um, to get a party started. Um, and we really like this kind of analogy for people who can inspire others to make change. The idea of um, if you want to fill a dance floor at a party, you just need one person um, to start dancing and others will follow their lead. Um, and uh, by coincidence, that is also an analogy that um, Sophie uses in her work. Um, so um, tomorrow at noon, um, if you've signed up for Social Capital Week, you'll get the email tomorrow morning with the link. Um, and um, please join us. Uh, we'll be talking for half an hour and then plenty of time for questions um, all around this idea of uh, how we can how we can get parties started um, in a better and more natural way. Um, and my word, have we learned a lot about that today already. Um, on the screen uh, is a QR code and a link to a uh, Padlet, which has all of our uh, recommended reading and social capital texts from the week, including um, the XR book. So if you want to find out um, more about how um, the XR movement has worked, um, the link to the book is there. So um, that's it in terms of um, what we have um, going on uh, tomorrow. Uh, check out the Social Capital website, social, uh, growsocialcapital.org.uk um, for recordings of all of this week's sessions um, and much, much more, including blogs and podcasts. Um, so that's it. I will be quiet um, and um, hand back over uh, to Caroline and Ronan. And if anybody uh, wants to stay on, um, we'll, we're going to keep this Zoom link open uh, to continue the conversation. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll open it back up to the floor. Thank you. And for those who want to leave or need to leave now, uh, just finish, to finish the meeting, we always finish our meetings by expressing gratitude. So we check in and we check out. And the way we check out is what am I grateful for that happened during this meeting? So it's focusing always in the now, in what we've experienced with other people. So what am I grateful for that happened during this meeting? So I'm encouraging you, if you need to go, to put it in the chat box before you leave. Some, some of you have already started, but that's how we check out as well within, uh, at, from an XR meeting. If you don't mind um, stopping to share the, the screen, um, so we can see yeah. people.